I accepted this topic tonight on one condition. And the one condition was that there would not be anything left in this auditorium for people to throw. I, I was even taking that seriously enough that my wife encouraged me to go out and get a couple of bags of marshmallows. So that if you were tempted to throw something, all you could throw was a marshmallow. So we'll see how that goes. There's nothing going to be complex that we're looking at tonight. Nothing earth-shaking. No breaking news. We're going to be looking at something sometimes that's been true since the creation. It's been true as long as time as we know it has existed. God's will in this matter is also very simple. Sadly, it's man that has made it complex. And man that has stirred things up and made gray areas and things such as this as it relates to the home. What we're going to be talking about specifically tonight is woman's role in the home or the wife's role in the home. Now, in the introduction, a couple of points we'll be looking at. There's logically going to be some, some overlap in some of the topics you've been looking at since we've been talking about that. So bear with me as we look at that, and then we'll get down to a couple of particulars as it relates to our topic this evening. We are looking at something that is completely counterculture today. We are living in a culture that does not want to hear, does not like, does not agree with what God's Word has to say. And as a matter of fact, is trying to do everything it can do to wipe out the influence that God's Word has. I also want to tell you this evening that the book that I'm going to be using is going to be the Bible, and I want you to know that I didn't write it. But I will also never apologize for reading it and what it has to say. Marriage is a relationship and a union that's designed by God. It's a relationship that involves God, a man, and a woman. And I don't care what the pundits of today say as it relates to how society views these things. Man and woman, by mutual consent, enter a relationship together. But the procedure is that which must be consistent with divine law. You can call a lot of relationships today if you want to a marriage. I refuse to do so and I'll say more about that here in just a few moments. Despite the societal standards today, we're looking at God, a man, and a woman that constitute this relationship. When you look at marriage in our world today, according to anthropologists, according to their studies, there is no society in existence in which marriage does not exist in some form. It may not be of the nature of marriage as we understand it here, but there is a concept across all cultural lines, everywhere in the world, there is some concept of marriage. So therefore, it is a universal concept. It is a biblical concept. It is a societal concept. It is a cultural concept. But it's also universal if every culture known to man has some aspect of marriage or some relationship similar to that in it. Well, if that's the case, then the law of cause and effect comes into play here. There must be a reason for that global phenomenon. Why does every culture have a marriage? Why is there some relationship akin to marriage that crosses all cultural lines? Well, there's only two options. It's either supernatural or it's natural in origin. Evolutionists say that it is a human development, marriage is, and that it was something that developed from animal mating relationships. Here we go with the monkeys again. They're going to bring that same old tired argument out that all we are is animals and we're operating on animal instinct. Well, that's how they explain this global phenomenon of marriage. Well, the Bible teaching is very clear and straightforward as to the cause of the marriage relationship. God created man and from his side made woman. Remember, I said it wasn't going to be deep. <laughs> it's not going to be rocket science. 
God created man and from him he created woman and instituted what we see regarding marriage. The two were designed to cleave to one another. Genesis chapter 2 verses 21 through 25 makes four primary points. Number one, God caused a deep sleep. Number two, he took a rib from Adam. Number three, they were to leave father and mother. And number four, the two became one flesh. We're going to build on that concept as we go through today. Jesus also showed the universal nature of this arrangement. Be turning, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to read verse 6 in just a moment. But let's set the stage briefly for what we're looking at there. In Matthew chapter 19, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were trying to get him to make a choice. There were three different rabbinical schools that were in existence, and each of those rabbinical schools had a different idea of when you could divorce your wife. And what, in essence, they were attempting to do was to get Jesus to choose one of those rabbinical schools. Pick, they say. But then we look what Jesus did. He says, from the beginning, it was not so. Rather than choose a rabbinical school, what Jesus did was to go back to a principle that was established at the very first. One man, one woman for life. That's the ideal that's portrayed. Now, I know there are people around the world who, if they hear me right now, are laughing at what I'm saying. The concept of one man, one woman for life is ludicrous to many in the world today. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 6, So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, it's not going to be in line with our study this evening to continue in Matthew 19 because there is an exception clause there. Sadly, it's a, an exception clause that's misunderstood by many, and it's completely rejected by many more. We're not talking about the exception tonight, though. We're talking about the ideal. What was God's intent for the home? One man, one woman, staying together forever for their life. But here's a crucial point, and we will need to understand this before we move ahead. If it is the case that marriage was designed and established by God, then he has the authority to set the rules. And only he has the authority to set the rules. Men and women do not have the right to treat this sacred relationship in a self-directed manner. We simply cannot choose to change things to fit our will or to fit our preference. If we are going to have a home as God would have it, we're going to allow him to set the parameters. And here's a word we don't like, and it's a word we're going to hear a lot tonight. We must submit our wills to his in that sense. Number one, let's look at the traits of marriage for a little while this evening. First of all, the marriage relationship is between a man and a woman. Today's call for same-sex unions is the result of a degenerate worldview. Now, please notice that I did not call those same-sex marriages. I know they do in society. I know they do in the media. I know you see that everywhere. But that does not fit what the Bible defines for me as what marriage is. Marriage is one man, one woman, with God in the process. Now, I've got some change in my pocket. I talked about this last week at Beltline Road as it relates to unity. I've got different coins in my pocket. I can pull out a quarter and I can pull out a nickel. Just as different as they can be, right? Yeah, they're both metal, but they're different sizes and they have different values. They're not the same coin. But I can take a tube of super glue 
And I can put a dab of super glue on a quarter, stick a nickel on it, and they'll be joined together. There'll be union there. But that does not mean they're the same. We must see that these are not marriages in the sense of divine recognition. Man can call sin whatever he wants to. He can call it a marriage if he chooses to. But he doesn't have the right to set divine parameters. Now we're living in a world that has been inundated by at least in a third generation of postmodernism today. And postmodernism in a nutshell simply says there's no such thing as absolute truth. Whatever's true to you might not be true to me. Whatever's true to, to me might not be to you, vice versa. From this ph uh, uh, philosophy was born the phrase, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. There are many who call themselves Christians today that honor the concept of same-sex marriage, saying that God approves of it and that we just simply need to be more tolerant of such things ourselves, rather than being so crass and unfeeling about these things. Well, brethren, again, I'm not an apologetic kind, and I'm going to call what something is by its nature. It's sin. It's sin because it's contrary to God's will. Marriage was designed to be monogamous. The first polygamous, by the way, was Lamech, who was a descendant of Cain, Genesis chapter 4, verse 19. Polygamy was tolerated under the Old Testament system, but it still wasn't under God's plan. It wasn't part of God's ideal. Because of the hardness of men's hearts, God allowed certain things to transpire that were not what he had in mind in the outset. Jesus indicated later that that laxness would not be included under the New Testament system. But here we go. I hope I don't hear any songbooks sliding out because I know those can be thrown a distance. Marriage was designed as a hierarchical arrangement. In a biblical marriage, there is a concept of a hierarchy, and that is a standard of authority, one being head over another, and down we go. The New Testament is clear that the husband is to be head of the wife, but notice the qualification as Christ is head of the church. The wife is to submit to her husband. We're going to talk about that submission more here in just a few moments. But look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands. As to the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Now we also need to understand this. This does not provide for a dictatorship. And it does not provide grounds for abuse. And it is done that way today. There are husbands who treat their wives as if they are the dictator of the home. And heaven help the poor wife that doesn't fall in line with what the dictator has to say. There are others who see themselves as the head of the house. And they see their wife as nothing more than property. And oftentimes treat them in that fashion. Those two verses that we just read do not give license for that kind of abuse of what's being said. A husband who loves his wife will provide gentle leadership. But he will not rule with an iron fist. What this does is it acknowledges a hierarchy of authority in the home. This is not my phrase. I borrowed it from somewhere. If I remember where, I'd give them credit. It was in my file somewhere. Brethren, our wife is not our property. 
She is our partner. And let's continue looking at that concept. Now, before we go any further, let's understand that society right now completely disagrees with, rejects, and mocks everything that I've just said. My wife watches a show. I say she watches it. I kind of follow along, but I'm on my iPad a lot whenever she... It's a show called Counting On. How many of you remember the show 19 and Counting? Just a quick show of hands. 19 and Counting was about the Duggar family. Denominational family, but they're very moral, very spiritual. The show is very clean. Uh, they're not into dating. They're into courting. As a matter of fact, many of the kids get their first kiss on their wedding day. Their dates are chaperoned. And counting on is the next generation. Now those 19 kids are getting married and having kids. And Cheryl noticed something just the other day. There was something in the media that was picking apart one of the characters, hoping to find some mud to sling about that situation. One of the cleanest shows on television, even though they are not members of the church of the New Testament, they live lives that are based on spiritual concepts. They have a very clear understanding of roles in the home, and society is trying to find a way to bring that down, to make it dirty, to make it nasty. If you can't deal with the message... <laughs> What has been the approach through the years? Let's take the messenger down. Let's try to make them filthy. Number two, and here we go, the duties of the wife. I chose that word specifically because I know that some bristle at the word duty as it relates. The first duty, there's two duties we want to discuss this evening. We could have had a whole long list of these. But two duties. Number one, submit to your husbands. Now let's define our terms. What does he mean by submit? The Greek word here is the word hupotasso. And it means to subordinate or to obey. Well, that's not getting any better as it relates to the world, is it? We don't like the concept of obeying, do we? I learned obedience pretty quick at home because dad was Sergeant Mac on base and he was Sergeant Mac at home. If I heard the word pat, I really didn't make any kind of movement to indicate that I was hearing anything. If I heard the word Patrick, my ears perked up like our dog's ears perk up when somebody's coming in. But if I heard the words Patrick, Henry, Back to back, I better already be moving toward the source of where that was. I remember back talking my mama one time. And as I picked myself up off the kitchen floor after being backhanded away from a dining room table, I sat up and I said, yes, sir, and I did what mom had me to do. So, but in this day of postmodernism, obedience to obey is a four-letter word. I had the privilege, if you can call it that, of substituting in the local school systems for about a year. I, uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I refused to do so at high school and middle school in Cleburne. One day was all it took. But I see a lot of kiddos looking at a teacher and simply saying no when told what to do. But I see that in Walmart. Just the other day, I heard a child scream no in her mother's face when told what to do. Again, that's foreign to me. I cringe when I hear those things because of what was ingrained in me regarding obedience. And here's something I learned. If those kids don't respect their parents at home, why should they respect somebody else in the school system or anywhere else that they may come into contact? You see, obedience is learned. And sadly, we have a generation today that does not want to think they have to obey anybody. And yet that's what we're seeing in this concept of the word submit, to obey. It means to be under obedience, in subjection to, or to submit oneself to. 
It refers to submitting to someone's orders or the, to the directives of someone else. In John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus submitted to the Father in this same fashion. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus Christ was in obedience to the Father. Well, in this sense, wives are to submit to their own husbands. Look at Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 24. We've already looked at one of those verses. Wives are to submit, and again, I'm qualifying that, to their own husbands. I have no say over anybody else's wife. And nobody else's wife has to fall in line with the directives that I have. We're talking about a single husband and wife relationship that's being discussed. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now again, brethren, I didn't write this. I didn't put that word everything there. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to obey. Sometimes we have to do things we don't like. Right, Russ? Didn't learn that in the military, did you? I don't think he, I don't think he liked every order that might be given. But I, knowing Russ, I would imagine Russ submitted to authority. I didn't like doing what my parents had to do. Every once in a while, though, my dad said, you're going to do it and you're going to like it. I don't know how he could have enforced that. This presumes that the husband is leading according to God's will. The wife is to submit or to obey the husband as far as the husband is leading her as God would have him to do so. No wife has to put up with the husband binding something or loosing something that God has revealed and telling her she must obey because she's the wife. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Brethren, I know of wives who have left the home to go to services with their husbands not liking that they were going. They submitted to their husbands in other ways, but the authority of the husband does not mean he can tell her not to go to services and her fall in line with that. Likewise, subjects, or excuse me, husbands are not to abuse their authority in the home. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Here's what the world can't understand. The world can under, cannot understand how I use the word submit and honor in the same sentence. But that's exactly what Peter said. Honoring her that says something about our leadership we've already said that husbands are to love their wives in the same fashion as Christ loved the church let's continue in Ephesians 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her notice the degree to which husbands are to love their wives that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Here's a key concept, another, another nail peg we need to drive down. What is the motivation for us to serve, to honor, to obey Christ? Is it out of fear? Maybe partly. But it's out of love. We do what we are instructed to do by Christ and by God because we love them. Love is their motivating factor for giving us these directives. My parent, my kids had a hard time understanding that discipline is love. 
and correction is love. But I did so not because I hated them. I did so because I loved them and I wanted them to be, to behave a certain way. It's the same way the relationship that we have with Christ. We ought to do biblical things. We ought to be servants. We ought to obey God's will because we love him. That should be our motivation. The same is true, though, for all Christians in other areas. We are to submit to God in this fashion. We are to submit to the government in this fashion. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Now, here we go. I'm about to go from preaching to meddling. I know there are places that a 55-mile-an-hour speed limit is ridiculous. It's ridiculous to have to drive 30 miles an hour coming into Cleburne from the south. There's nothing out there. But you know, obeying that law doesn't require my liking it, but my submitting to what the authorities have to say. We're also to submit to our elders. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. We also submit to one another, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Wives are to submit without nagging, with quietness, with gentleness. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, and I know I'm going to have to hurry. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. How are we told here the wife might win her husband to Christ by living as Christ would have her to live and by setting the example of the same for others? Wives are to submit with respect as Sarah respected Abraham. Look at verses 5 and 6 as we continue. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Excuse me, that's verse, uh, that's chapter 2. For in this manner... In former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. When wives fail to submit, God's not pleased. Let me say that again, please. When wives fail to submit, God is not pleased. Colossians 3.18. This is why. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That word fitting is appropriate, is right, or is correct. That's what God wants them to do. That word used for fitting also pertains to what is due, or here we go again, duty. When wives fail to submit, the family will often be in turmoil. If you're going to have a social organization that is functional, then you have to have some kind of chain of authority within that structure, or else chaos is the alternative. The hierarchy relating to God and man is clearly portrayed again in 1 Corinthians 11:3 3 
But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Can you imagine how different things would look in our society today if people lived their lives as husbands and wives or fathers and mothers or children as God directed us to? Is it not scary that we have a divorce rate in this country that one in every two marriages ends in divorce? Why is that? Because it's chaos, because they're living as man would live rather than God would have them to live. You know, for years, the divorce rate of our world was up here and the divorce rate in the church was down here. Sadly, it's not that way anymore. Sadly, they're growing closer and closer as time goes. What's going on? Is the world finally getting it and beginning to do what's right? Or is the church falling prey to the influence of society and being impacted by society rather than impacting society in the way that we should? The second duty was to love your husbands. I'm going to have a third point I'm probably not going to have time to get to tonight. This involves affection for one another. Paul provided this instruction to Titus in Titus chapter 2 and verse 4. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. The word that's used here for love is the word philandrus, and it's defined as being fond of man. Here it's used as having affection for her husband. This affection, though, is that which can be learned. If the younger women in any congregation would seek counsel from the older women in a congregation, there's much that can be learned about affection. Again, that's not my opinion. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and see that very thing. But again, we're looking at a society, we're looking at a generation of our younger people who in the public school system, through media, through music, through anything we're looking at, is basically saying you're on your own, you have your own right to make your own decisions, and don't listen to anybody else. And sadly, we're looking at a generation that sees the older men and the older women in society as out of touch with the way things are. But this also includes intimacy. The wife is to be intimate with her husband, helping to prevent unfaithfulness. Now, I know we're getting out into some uncomfortable ground here, talking about the private affairs things that belong in the bedroom of our homes. But it's given to us as direction. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 2. As a matter of fact, stay there because we're going to look at a couple of passages there in just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 2. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Why do we get married? Well, a wife was provided to Adam because he was alone and God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. So relationship is one thing. In our later years, my wife and I are enjoying much more time with one another. I was so pleased she got to go to Ukraine with me this last trip. It's the first time in 15 years that she's been able to travel with me overseas. And it's something that I could share with her that made it even that much more special, the love that I have of taking the gospel to the Ukrainians. So affection and relationship is one, but this refers also, or it is referred to as a marital right. And it's not to be withheld. Look at verses three and four. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have have authority over his own body, but his wife does. 
Now, without making a G sermon PG, let's just simply say that the, the, the sexual relationship is a major part of the marital situation. When one or the other desires to abstain, it is only to be done with mutual consent. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. Just as husbands are commanded to love their wives, so the wives are commanded to love their husbands. And if that original love has been lost, then it needs to be relearned. Why is the idea of the sexual relationship so key? It goes hand in hand with the way we've been created. You see, we've been created with certain drives that help us to do things. We need water. And so what happens? What does our body do? We get thirsty. And the body tells us that we need something to drink. We need food. Some of us more than others. But we've been created with a, with, 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 with a food drive, a drive to eat, a hunger. And sometimes when people get well down that road of not being satisfied with food and water, then they can do some pretty crazy things to attain that. Well, brethren, we've also been created to differing degrees with a sex drive. As part of our relationship is to procreate, to continue, to bring about life. But there's a lot of temptation out there. What if me or my wife were to withhold sexual favors and sometimes just, just done for spite and anger? I'll show him or I'll show her. The sex drive doesn't stop. It continues. And God in his wisdom has given us instruction on how to deal with that so as not to sin if we find ourselves in that situation. One more point, and I've got about three minutes to get there. The wife also is to manage the home. One way in which that is done is homemakers. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. The word or the Greek word for homemakers is literally translated as a stayer at home. So does this mean that our wife is supposed to stay barefoot and pregnant and in front of the stove and washing dishes and washing my clothes and, and on and on? Well, let's take a look at that. Essentially, it refers to one who takes care of the house, one who is domestically inclined to deal with such things. This doesn't mean that the wife has to do it all, but it does mean that the home is the wife's primary responsibility. Her primary responsibility is not that job. Her primary responsibility is not necessarily what she enjoys doing. Can she do those things? Yes, she can. We are living in, in times today when sometimes both spouses have to work. That's just a financial reality, but that still does not remove the responsibility of the wife to also take care of things at home. You know, we show affection. We talked about affection earlier, and sometimes affection is more than, than just a hug. Or, or, or a peck on the cheek. Every once in a while, I'll step up and do the dishes. My wife realizes affection when things are done for her in that way. I enjoy cooking, so I do most of the cooking. We live on two entirely different diets. She has to go gluten-free. I'm on Weight Watchers now. And so, I, I, in essence, I, I do the cooking, but I enjoy doing the cooking. But this does not remove her from her God-given responsibility in the home. Let me close by saying this, and we'll extend the invitation. The Christian wife is a woman who submits to her husband with respect. She loves her husband with affection. She manages her home and her children. But this is because the Christian wife is also a woman who is a Christian first and a wife second. She gladly accepts her biblical role regardless of what society has to say about it. 
And she looks to God's word and prayer for her strength as she seeks to fulfill her duty as the wife in the home. I do want to share one more quick point. Uh, I wanted to kind of close with a little bit of humor to kind of lighten the situation. And I found something that Mark Copeland had put on the Internet about the Ten Commandments for the wife. I want to just share one of those with you. It says, you shall not nag him. Hit him with a frying pan, it's more kind. 